This is pretty cool. You guys, this conference was the number one trend this morning when I first logged on. You were doing better than both, uh, better than both uh, Sarah Palin and Tina Fey, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> That's saying something. All right, let's see. Let's get some slides up here. I wanna, how many of you, uh, one second. How many of you uh, uh, were watching the Olympics this summer? It was uh, really just phenomenal. I must have watched the opening ceremonies in the beautiful like HD four or five times. I, I was just overwhelmed by how gorgeous it was. Uh, these guys in particular, right? They were, um, there was 2008 drummers on the floor of the big bird's nest uh, uh, theater or uh, stadium that they had there. Uh, and they're all beating in time uh, to some music. And while they're doing this, right, they're, um, they're doing, uh, every time they hit their drum, it lights up. And they're counting down uh, three, two, one, until, what was it? It was the eighth second of the eighth minute of the eighth hour of the eighth day of the month of 2008. Uh, eight very lucky number in China. But they were, and they were counting this. Unbelievable to see this. is so much sort of choreography, so much human uh, uh, coordination just absolutely blew me away. Um, so many of them, uh, as this big performance, in such detail if you look at this, um, just absolutely phenomenal and really kind of an interesting sort of metaphor for what I wanted to talk about today, which was how all of our collective tiny little behaviors that we do all the time, although probably not as choreographed as these guys, um, can add up into some pretty remarkable things. Uh, and in particular, when we start to look for patterns in those things, um, we do we find uh, very, very impressive results. And so that's a bit about what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, what I think is coming sort of in the future uh, here on the web, or at least as far out as we could possibly see, um, and what we should do about it as people that kind of build the web every day. Uh, so let's get into this. I like to talk about the future uh, by talking about the past. And I'd like to start in 1974. Uh, because I think 1974 is a pretty mar remarkable year with implications for what we do today on the web and for what we're going to be doing for years to come. Uh, 1974, to me, is kind of conceptually the end of the 60s. Uh, our, with our, at least with our recent uh, history, I've been history major uh, in school, uh, studying history of journalism, and one of the things I learned is that our chronological years and our conceptual understanding of decades in the 20th century don't always line up, right? And 1974 is sort of when a lot of the stuff that was happening in the 60s in the counterculture and underneath the mainstream kind of bubbled up into everybody's daily lives and became real for people. For example, here you can see 1974, the environmental movement that the, that the sort of hippies and the counterculture uh, was uh, really adamant about really hit home to people when the OPEC oil crisis happened. And as you can see, uh, the prices of gas skyrocketed to 81 cents a gallon. Can you imagine? Right? Uh, but it was a big deal, right? Like people couldn't get gas and they were waiting in line and you could only buy gas on odd and even days based on your license plate number, crazy stuff like that. For the first time, people were like, maybe we, there's something to be said about sustainability in the environment. Uh, likewise, uh, the sort of uh, anti-authoritarian mistrust of authority, that sort of stuff that was brewing and bubbling down under the surface came up, 1974, the Watergate crisis, uh, when, when President Nixon here with one of his trusted advisors uh, <laughs> had the same office, right? Like, kind of shook the country in a pretty fundamental way that it hadn't uh, before. And these changes were happening, like, all throughout our culture in America here. If you think about entertainment, right? You think about the 60s, um, 1974, uh, was the first year that these guys released an album. Uh, and talk about a shift, right? From from where music had been before to where it was going. Uh, anybody here have this poster in your bedroom? Like I did? Yes, there you go. Fancy. Wow, a bunch of you. That's pretty cool. Um, that case, say that reminds me, how many of you were not born in 1974? Oh, <laughs> All right, we got a lot to talk about this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all right, so no. the same sort of things and big shifts were happening in business as well. This is when, next step forward, is when Congress, or uh, rather the House of Representatives, started proceedings and breaking apart the natural, the natural monopoly of our telecommunications system here in this country. At that same time, as this sort of big centralized focus of power was being taken apart, bubbling up from underneath, was the first mention in the white paper from Ben Cerf and Robert Kahn uh, using the term internet for the very first time. Big shifts, change happening. Um, I had a bit of a, 
sort of an epiphany that happened in my life. This picture of me in 1974. Uh, that's me right there in the, uh, in the gray next to my brother. I'm pointing and laughing at this ridiculous plaid pants there. Um, but I guess it was, it was the 70s. Uh, I was six years old in 1974. One of the things I really enjoyed doing was going shopping with my mom. Uh, the reason for that is that we always got to go, when we went to Sears, we got to go to the restaurant that was inside Sears. This is kind of before food courts and the mall and stuff like that. Uh, and we'd go to the Sears and have lunch, and uh, you know, and it was a very big deal for me as a little kid. One time when we went uh, this year, that year, we um, we couldn't find a seat. It was very busy uh, on that day, and so we sat in the back corner at this really weird-looking table with a glass tabletop. And when we sat down at that table and looked down through the glass tabletop, we could see that there was a television pointing up at us, and on the screen was this. <laughs> And it was the very first time in my six-year-old life that I'd ever seen a video game. And I had this tiny little six-year-old epiphany that I could control what's on the screen. And that was amazing to me. And we had quarters in and we were playing with it. And, uh, and eventually I convinced my mom, uh, oh, this, is, this is what it looked like, one of these deals with the knobs on it. You could turn it, you could control what was on the screen. Eventually I convinced my mom that, that we should have one at home. And so uh, that Christmas I, I got one of these and my brother and I would play for hours and hours. Uh, uh, by Bob uh, controlling what was on the screen, participating in what was happening in what had traditionally been, up until that point, a consumptive media, right? A media where we were not participants, where we simply engaged in consumerism. But now we could start to participate. And that sort of led, if you look at I'll show you a sort of a, a brief history of my engagement with technology over time. Uh, this is how, the, and, and from there, sort of increasingly more sophisticated tools for participation in what's happening on the screen. So that was, uh, that was sort of a big deal in my life and, and, and set a, a tone for the rest of my career. Uh, at the same time, that same year, 1974, IBM released their first hard drive. This is a Winchester 3030 hard drive. We call it the Winchester after the shotgun, I guess. Uh, because it had 30 millisecond seek time and 30 megabytes of storage. And look at how productive it made those people. Look at that. They're getting stuff done. Uh, I mean, uh, this is important because this is really the, kind of the first commercially viable uh, hard drive uh, that they produced. Uh, before, it was always sort of uh, custom installations and things like this. But you just almost, almost buy this right off the shelf. Uh, although they leased it. And if you did the math for what they were leasing it for in 74, in today's dollars, uh, it came out to be about $100,000 a gigabyte. So we've come a long way, I'd say, considering today you can sign up for Amazon Web Services and you can lease from them a gigabyte for about 15 cents a month. And I get an email every six weeks telling me that this has gone down a little more, a couple pennies less every time. Uh, so clearly, the storage has not only become commoditized as a business, but it has become accessible in a way that is remarkable. And, and what that means is there's been this tremendous proliferation of data storage. It's just data in our lives. There's just data everywhere. Uh, it surrounds us, and, and we're awash with this data. Uh, and if you put those two things together, this tremendous amount of storage with the tools for participation, we sort of get this, this roadmap, I think, for where we're heading on the web, which is that we are in control of what is happening here, but there's way too much happening for us to feel any sense of control. So that's what I'd like to dig into, and in particular, I'd like to start with how I'm a designer, uh, kind of by trade. Uh, and so I take kind of a design and user experience focused look at these sort of things. Uh, and so I'd like to take a look at just a whole bunch of data and see how we might use design to help put people back in control of the data that is kind of flooding through their lives. There is tons of data in the world, right? Tons of data in our lives. Uh, I saw that when I was at Google. I spent about two years at Google. Uh, I left in May. Uh, and while I was there, uh, I saw a scale of data that I didn't even think possible. I remember coming into the office one day so excited that I bought a terabyte hard drive. Right? And I was like, I oh, terabyte. Do you know how much you And the engineer that I was sitting next to it just kind of shook his head and laughed and said, yeah, we, we fill up a few of those every day. And I was like, oh. Uh, I, I still think it's pretty cool. Um, uh, YouTube, one of my colleagues who worked at YouTube told me that every single minute of the day, every minute of the day, 13 hours of video gets uploaded. Now, I don't know what all that video could possibly be, 
And I think it's awesome that we are collecting so much of this stuff. But that also puts responsibility on those of us who are the collectors and who are responsible for sort of caretaking people's data to make it accessible to them and to give them some sense of, of control and ownership of their data. And that's, uh, that's what I'm going to show you here. This is a bunch of data. Um, when I uh, look at this, it makes me feel a little dumb because I don't know what it is and I don't know what I should do with it. But I also realize at this point in my career that if I'm sort of feeling dumb, it's usually not my fault. It's usually the fault of somebody who's trying to communicate to me and it's not doing it very effectively. So I think since design really is communication, we can help understand and put this data into context by doing a little visual communication. And we can start by adding some metadata. So here, just by adding some simple labels, I can show you that I'm uh, displaying on the screen average rainfall in inches per month for some North American cities. And now you can start to make use of this data. You can start to see that this data uh, means something, right? And you can kind of put your mind around it. I think we can do a better job of that using some design techniques. For example, we could add typography uh, and, and some uh, uh, arrangement of the typography such that you can see what's more important and let receive what's less important, still valuable, but less important. We can create a bit of visual hierarchy here. Uh, I can also do uh, something like this to make the data even more accessible and e even easier for you to use. Right? So now I've taken the value of each one of the table cells and changed the hue of the color behind it, or I guess rather the saturation of the color behind it, such that the, you can really tell. Right? Even if you're in the back of the room and you couldn't see the numbers before, you can at least tell now that if you go to Miami in the summertime, you're going to get rained on. And San Francisco is very, very dry in the summer. So I've made that data more accessible, more actionable, uh, and more, frankly, uh, more efficient for you. You don't have to think as much about the numbers to get meaning from them. Now I could take this a step further and try this. Who thinks that's better? Really nobody here. Oh, good. A couple of people here. <laughs> Educators like the data, I guess. Is that right? Um, and maybe, maybe better, right? And, and, you know, saying that you like it and somebody else doesn't means that there are differences in the audience. Um, Maybe the data is important, and certainly if you were all a bunch of meteorologists, you'd be like, let's go back to the data, let's go see the data. But perhaps, you know, if this was a little widget on a travel page, uh, and just very quickly, like, you're focused on getting a task done, but want to know a little bit about rainfall uh, in your destination, maybe that's okay. I don't know, but it's a dangerous line to start crossing, right? Like, when you get up that line between communication and declaration, I think we have to really be careful. And I see this all the time, uh, all over the place. In fact, the USA Today, sort of notorious for this, right? I have looked at this for months now, and I have no idea what they're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> they are, in fact, they, um, they do this a lot, but they become known for this, right? And the Onion, you know the Onion, the, that Lampoon newspaper thing? They do this all the time, right? If you look at this, uh, the numbers add up to like 136%. <laughs> <laughs> No, the U.S. Safety Council reminds all skaters that comments are regards. <laughs> but you see examples of, uh, of people making fun of the fact that it's so easy to decorate data, decorate it and, and lose the meaning. And I mean, this is something I found on the web not so long ago. It's a pie chart that shows the percentage of the chart that looks like pie chart. <laughs> So like I said, it's, it's pretty easy to, to go too far and decorate, right? Uh, so I think we have, we have a responsibility, right, with, with, with people's data to give them tools to make it accessible and understandable and to help them so they don't have to think so much about the data, but rather think about what they're trying to get done. And that was something that we paid a lot of attention to when I was at Google. We spent a ton of time, we spent about 14 months uh, just in the de design phase of redesigning Google Analytics uh, when I got there. And uh, it was something of a scale, again, that I, the, the scale of data that I had not, um, that I had, not uh, had any experience with before. And so we did a lot of research into figuring out, all right, what's the best way to approach? So many users, so much data, so many different views of that data uh, that we did some research. And I went back, uh, like I said, I'm a history maker, so I always go back to history. Um, and I want to show you some of the, the stuff that we looked at that inspired us for the work that we did by going back to 1854. This is an engraving from that time, uh, from the cholera outbreak in London's neighborhood of Soho, 1854. It was vicious. There had been cholera outbreaks for centuries uh, before that. 
but none as vicious as this one, this particular strain of cholera would. You know, people would wake up in the morning and have a bit of breakfast and go like, I don't think so. I'm not feeling so well. By lunchtime, they were motionless in bed, and by dinnertime, they were dead. So there was literally people dying in the streets in the neighborhood, and it affected one in three people. So if you imagine one in three people in a neighborhood as dense as Soho was at the time, absolutely, absolutely devastating what happened there. This guy, Dr. John Snow, lived in that neighborhood. He was perhaps the first anesthesiologist figuring out how chloroform worked and things like that, which made him very popular, as you can imagine, considering what they used before that to do surgical procedures. But he was also kind of into numbers and kind of into math and sort of interested in using math to track down what was happening. And he did. He used this map, which shows the cholera deaths in the neighborhood stacked up by address in the neighborhood of Soho. And he used this map to convince the city of London, the city council for the neighborhood, that the outbreak was not being spread by air, via the air, but being spread by water. And nobody had ever, they didn't understand they hadn't discovered germs yet. They didn't understand that disease could be airborne or waterborne. And he used this map to convince them of that. There had been plenty of visualizations before that about where people were dying and from what. And as you can see, those visualizations tended to take on some of the mythology of the day. For example, this one shows 100 years earlier an outbreak south of the Thames River that was, and that people thought, you know, like you can see black clouds moving over the city as it turns from block where it was breaking out. So what Snow did was track that down. But many people have written about and believe that he actually created the original chart, which he did. He took this chart, which was from a sewer engineer, a sanitation engineer, who had done the marks on the chart originally. Snow took that, and what he did was edited this, right? He took this map and took everything out of it that didn't actually show his point, which was that there was an infected pump right in the center of it, and that the people who were drinking from that pump were the ones who were dying. So not only was he able to use the data visualization by condensing the story, clarifying the story visually, but he was also one of the very first examples of using data visualization to prove empirical fact, right? To sort of get people to stop believing in a lot of mythology and superstition and, frankly, classism and racism of the day, and to say, like, look, I can show you where that's happening. And if you go to London, you can still see they still have the pump without a handle in that neighborhood in Soho. I went there not too long ago and had a little data visualization geek pilgrimage out and picture statement. I know, it's sad. But it's really cool to see that there. And, in fact, it's a little hard to see, but right across the street is a pub called the John Snow, where you can go and have a pint. I would recommend the beer and probably not the water there. Another classic example that we used as inspiration when we were doing an analytics redesign was this chart from Charles Joseph Minard, which shows Napoleon's march from Poland to Russia in 1812, 1813. He did this in the 1850s as well, or 1860s, rather. A remarkable visualization. And any of you who have read Edward Tufte can read pages of it in his books about how amazing this is. But what it does is it shows six different variables across the chart here. It is Napoleon's route that he took with his army. The width of the route, the width of this line, indicates the number of men that he had with him at the time. So it shows the population of his army, the route they took, the geography. It shows the time, right? And you can see that it decreased over time. And then on the route back, it also shows the temperature as they went through one of the most severe winters that Europe had seen in the 19th century. And you can see that that pathway just gets narrower and narrower and narrower as more and more men die on the way back. Just a tragic, tragic experience that they had there. I love this quote that I found while I was doing research about him. It says that the aim of my carte figurative, that's what he called these, the aim of my carte figurative is to convey promptly to the eye the relation not given quickly by numbers requiring mental calculation. Which I guess, you know, another way of thinking about that is really, like, don't make me think. At least don't make me think about your interface, right, to this data. Let me find the story that's in there. 
And I find that just absolutely uh, uh, a remarkable way to think about this. If you think about that chart of data that I showed you at the very beginning, and when I added the blue to it, you, had to, you were able to stop thinking about the numbers and see the patterns that were in there. Those patterns were uh, much more visible and emerged uh, a lot easier. Um, the story and the data is something that I've been uh, increasingly inspired by as well. There are so many stories in charts like this. In John Snow's chart with people dying around at home, in this chart you can see all kinds of stories. For example, when Napoleon crossed the Berezina River, right, right here where that arrow is, you can see him crossing that river with his troops and having literally 22,000 men die that day when they crossed across the river. You can see minus 20 degrees below zero, like just a disaster. And in fact, in French today, the, uh, the word Berezina is an idiom for uh, catastrophe. It was just a disaster. This is a, a fine art representation of the same story that we see in the NARC's representation of the data. So finding stories in the data and using design to illustrate that, to bring that forward, is, is a big thing there. Another is uh, you know, where people find inspiration. Harry Beck, uh, worked for the London Underground in the 1930s, and in 1936, he drew that chart, that map of the London Underground. And I love this photo because he's just so proud of it. Look at him, like, I think this is my chart. Um, <laughs> but this is what he had to work with. This is what they had beforehand showing the underground, uh, the tube system in London. Um, Harry wasn't a designer, though. Uh, he wasn't even an illustrator. He was an electrical engineer. He was a draftsman, so all day long, he would look at stuff like this, look at the map, look back at this, look at the map, and go, wait a minute, I think we can put these things together, right? We can do this in a way that's going to make more sense to people, especially the Londoners who only care, care about two things when they're on the tube. One is um, uh, what station connects with what other station, and then the other thing is what side of the river am I on? And, and this is his map that he drew to kind of illustrate that. Uh, so effective that it is still in use some, what is it, 19 years later? Um, Talk about scalability of the design. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, I like that Perry got the inspiration from his, uh, you know, from his daily work, from his, from those electrical uh, drafting uh, diagrams that he was doing all the time. The same thing really happened to us when we were doing the analytics read time. This is a chart that we used uh, that, that ended up in the product as a, kind of the main focal point of every one of the reports that we created. Uh, this is hard to get to though. Um, it's easy, you know, like when you're doing a case study design and you show the thing you got to and say, yeah, here's the thing we did. But to show the way that we got there, like sometimes you can see like we really were, we're just like we we're, we're trying all kinds of different things. This is one of the earliest prototypes. Murky uh, data itself is deceptive. I would, I would show this to people. I would say, is the pink on top of the green or is it behind the green? And again, like if you did the answers so clearly, right? Like this is not something that's going to work. And sometimes we're trying to shoot, shoot many different kinds of data points and, and stuff like that. So I told my team that like, well, let's hold off on this the visual, the information visualization part. Let's work on something else for a couple of weeks. We had some time to schedule. I said something will come to us. Let's just let's just put it on hold for now. And then literally like two weeks later, I was watching uh, the DVDs came out from the Indiana Jones. I was watching uh, Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the first movie. And you know how whenever he flies somewhere, they do that montage of the airplane and it's going over the cities and there's this line on the map that looks like this. Like this bit. Like I watched that and then the next night I had a dream where Indiana Jones airplane was flying over the charts and the numbers and the... <laughs> <laughs> and I went to work the next day and I'm like, you guys have to do it like the Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> I think... I think they're going to that now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but this is the inspiration then that sort of led us to the, the, the clean looking, but the charts, the dots, the, the whole thing. So it's interesting to see you know, where inspiration has come from. Historically, uh, you know, I looked at a bunch of things like that, but we also kind of looked into the real world for examples of how we can use data visualization as a way of understanding the context of the world around us. Um, I found a, a great website that is it, kind of funny. It's called uh, megapenny.com. Uh, and its sole purpose is to track the amount of pennies there are in the world or in the United States today. Uh, which it turns out is about, it's just over 2 billion pennies. This is their estimate for the U.S. Treasury Department. I love that it goes down to 72 cents. We estimate that there's like, uh, yeah, the proof. Uh, so how do you kind of put your head around $2 billion in pennies? What does that mean, right? Like, you probably have a couple of them in your pocket right now, but, um, but using some of these sort of ways of gaining perspective, I think, are pretty powerful. So for example, they, they start off by saying, 
this is ten dollars in pennies. It's about a four inch square that can sit on your desk and it weighs just over six pounds. All right, so I can visualize that, ten dollars a thousand pennies. Here's a million pennies as compared to a dentist, I guess. It's so, right? So it's ten thousand dollars and it weighs three tons. So we're starting to talk about, you know, a substantial number of pennies. That's a million pennies right there. This is a billion pennies, which is like five school buses. And this is the number of pennies that are in circulation right now. So that's how many we have in the world. So we gain insight in a rather pointless data point of our world. But at least we gain some insight there. And if you keep going at the website, it's fantastic. They're like, what's a trillion pennies look like? What's a quadrillion pennies look like? And they just go and go and it produces the birds in front of pennies. It's kind of funny. It's funny. That's megapenny.com. You should check it out. It's kind of funny. But it also kind of illustrates a way that we can help each other understand the world around us. And understand things of scale that we might not be able to just kind of think about in our heads without seeing in some sort of tangible way. The artist, Chris Jordan, does a fantastic job of this. His work are photo renderings that he does, computer-generated renderings that he does. And he then prints out at extremely high resolution and in enormous scale. This is one of his works in the gallery. You can see it's sort of 40 feet long by about 15 or maybe 20 feet tall. These panels that show statistics about our lives around us. This is, in particular, a very, very powerful one. Which you kind of walk in the room, you can imagine, like, literally, this here, compared to me, is about actual size, right? And as you walk up and get closer and closer to it, you can sort of see that he's rendering out plastic soda bottles. And then if you look at the little car next to this enormous display, you see that these are the two million plastic bottles that we use in this country every five minutes. And you think, oh my gosh, like, that's consumption, right? And that's consumption being tangible, and perhaps in a way that can actually change behavior, right? So that perhaps maybe we aren't using so many of these if this kind of stuff really makes that home. He has a quote in the artist statement that I absolutely love as well, saying that statistics can feel abstract and anesthetizing, making it difficult to connect with and make meaning. And how true is that, right? Like, that's the first thing I said when I saw the data from the rainfall before we did any work on it. It made me feel dumb. Right? It's abstract. And I looked at it and I kind of glossed over it. I'm like, what are the numbers? And finding a story in that data and bringing that story forward, right, and letting people engage with the story rather than trying to sort out the numbers is something that I think is incredibly important for us to do on the web every day. And that's one of the big sort of lessons we learned looking back at the historical data visualizations was that we need to find that story in the data. And then we need to tell that story in visual ways. Stunning designers. I worked at Wired Magazine in the, in the mid '90s, uh, and then I was over on the digital side working on uh, on Hotwire. But these designers were absolutely sort of the, the best in the world. I was I was I, I learned so much while I was working there. But one of the things that stood out while I was doing that was that the designers that were working on the magazine who came over to work on the website were very different, right? In that uh, the experience for them uh, was pretty dramatic. They had to kind of forget almost everything they knew about traditional design to bring it to the web. The most important aspect of that was control, was giving up this sense of control. Control, and we consider that as a sort of uh, as a constraint, right? Like uh, we couldn't 
control the typography. We didn't even know how big the page would be when it's rendered. We had no control over color and people's monitors and things like that. A very different experience from obsessing over a printed magazine and sending out the artifact to people. Now we were simply sending our content, sending some recommendations for how it might be rendered, and hoping that it worked out on our users' screens. Very difficult to give up the control there. But one thing that I understood and saw dramatically was the designers who did give up the control and rather embrace this as an amazing part of the web were the ones who were most successful. The ones who were able to make that transition from the sort of print world into the web world were the ones that had kind of go zen about things and say, I have no control. What can I do to my content to make it as flexible and adaptable as I possibly could? I saw this most clearly uh, with a designer named Dave Shea, who created the CSS Zen card about five or six years ago now, I think it was. Uh, one single piece of very structured, semantic, marked up copy. Some content that he put up, and then held a contest to see who could add a style sheet to it in the most dramatic and, and uh, moving and interesting and wacky way. Literally thousands of designers created different designs with this one piece of content, showing this incredible separation between content and presentation that leads to this sort of giving up control over time. You can see this in designers all over the place. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Key, who has written a number of books on Ajax uh, lately, even a super simple example on his website, like this, uh, this uh, pull-down pull menu that has different themes that can be applied to his website. Kind of silly and pointless, like you can select this element theme and it kind of turns into <laughs> You know, this view, for those of you who know Jeffrey Zeldin, even the half a face thing is just kind of cool. Um, but it just shows that he understands that his content, right, can be viewed in a variety of different ways. I view content, uh, most of the content that I consume on a daily basis looks like this to me, right? This is how I see almost everything that I read online. I don't see the design at all because I'm using an RSS aggregator to get through as much content as efficiently and quickly as I possibly can. So that means that all the, the, the work that a designer has done on the visual presentation isn't even coming through, which is completely inappropriate, especially when you think about devices like this. How many of you have seen your website in a browser like this one? This is a Braille browser where you put your fingertips right on this sort of keyboard here, and you can listen through your fingertips to what's coming through, uh, through the web pages or the computer interfaces that you're looking at, and then use buttons above to respond. So really, it was about giving up this control, the sense of control uh, in the design work that we do, embracing this sense of change. And so if we think about that in the context of the data that we've been looking at, trying to transform for people, we can go from uh, us as designers and developers and content owners and people who build websites, from finding stories in the data and illustrating or sometimes decorating those stories that we find, to giving up control and putting the data in users' hands and giving them tools for manipulating that data so they can find their own stories. That's, I think, the big shift that has happened with all of us coming online and using the web. Now this is a ridiculously simple example of that, right? but I've scratched the surface now on interactivity. And, and what I mean by that is giving control over to users so that they can find their stories here. Now, using an interface, right, rather than simply looking at what I thought was the interesting story. So enabling people to find their stories in their data is, I think, the big point, right? Whether it's data or content or anything, but giving the control over to them to find it is what's really, really powerful about the web today. And increasingly so, moving forward, as we have more and more data about ourselves online. So for example, looking at here, the map of the relationships that we have in social networking. This is something in my case, Sorry, my face. <laughs> Either my face or Facebook profile. <laughs> but there's social craft, right? Visualized for them to help them make some meaning and some sense over that. Or, for example, the music that people listen to. This is a, uh, um, you, there's a site called Last FM where you can put a little tracker inside your iTunes. It'll, list, it'll report back to the website what you're listening to. And then you can, like, you know, it'll make recommendations, basic uh, uh, collaboration engine like that. But you can also visualize that and see what you were listening to and see very clearly when you weren't using your computer at the end of August and you were on vacation. Patterns emerging from data, even data that's super important to us, right? This is uh, every block. It's a website that takes streams of data from government and normalizes that data and formats it at the block level of, I think we're up to six or seven different uh, metropolitan areas in, in the world. Uh, this is, this is uh, my blog. 
This is the stuff that's happening. So everything from crime reports to uh, health code violations to uh, building permits and even news articles that mention addresses that are near me. But taking lots and lots of data, presenting it to people in a way that they can find the story that's interesting for them. Or how about what Nike is doing with, with Apple, right? You put a chip in your shoe and it comes to your iPod and then you connect it to the web and you can visualize data and compete with your friends. I mean, we live in the future. That's impressive that we can do this kind of stuff. We can do the same thing with, the, with, the, with, our, desk, with, our, with our computers. You can, uh, this is from Rescue Time, which tracks what you're doing on your computer all day long and then provides visual, visualizations, charts and graphs with your level of productivity and efficiency. Yeah, I know it's like this is a nightmare to me. <laughs> but it's just another example of collecting tremendous amounts of data and making it accessible for people. It's difficult for us designers because we don't know what the story is going to be, right? We, just like we didn't know what the what the bots were going to be that people had installed or the or a screen resolution that they had. Likewise, we don't know what's going to be important to people. Right? So instead of us finding the story, again, we have to let them do that by creating tools that let them manipulate their own data. Uh, there's a group, uh, there's a design agency called Stamen in San Francisco that's worked with a real estate company called Trulia to make this visualization uh, of real estate. Right? You can zoom in on a place and you can see it. It's really a, a rather remarkable uh, tool. But I love, I don't know if you can see down here, you use the data as the interface, as the way of navigating, right? We did something uh, similar with Google Reader, an RSS reader, uh, with a trends page where you can use the data of your behaviors to interact with the system as a method for navigation. Um, likewise, as a, uh, as a method for sort of understanding how you use uh, uh, the content in your life, what your usage patterns are, and the optimizing the site around that, uh, like deleting stuff that's not updated or that you don't read very often, things like that. Again, patterns that emerge in the data, creating opportunities for action for people to control the data that's coming through their lives. That graph that I showed you of somebody's social network is interesting, but not that useful. This is the same thing. This is somebody's, this is my, in fact, social network, uh, and, a, and an interface with a website called Doppler has put on top of that network to allow me to sort of manage what my relationships are with people in their context, right? So I have an overall sort of graph of the people that I am connected to, but this is sort of uh, permissions management, where who can see when I'm traveling and where I'm going, and, and likewise they can do the same with me, and, uh, and this turns into a big sort of uh, a bunch of serendipity where I uh, find out that I'm in an airport with, the same, with one of my friends at the same time, that kind of stuff. It's great, but this is an interesting interface to allow me to do that. Uh, likewise, uh, this is the application that we sold to Google when I was, uh, uh, and I guess we did that about three years ago. It's called MetroMap, and it's an analytics tool specifically for bloggers. But again, we used people's data as a navigational path for them to discover and ask about what they found there, right? Um, using, uh, using the charts and graphs as a way of interacting with the system as a way of understanding, like, whoa, what's going on here, and things like that. So finally, I think we have to, uh, we have to provide filters, really to enable clarity for people, right? Just like I was trying to do, moving from the blue squares into the raindrops, um, we need to help people understand this unbelievable amount of data by helping them winnow it down just to the data that's really important to them. Uh, let me show you a couple examples uh, that I really like. This is um, from, uh, an application called Gapminder, which was uh, also acquired by Google not three years ago. Uh, this is literally, we're looking at literally millions, hundreds of millions of data points right here. Um, I have configured this particular visualization so that on the vertical axis we have life expectancy of people on Earth and income per person across the horizontal axis, right? So how long they live and how much money they make. Every circle is a country in the world. Uh, the color of the circle is the continent that it's in. And the size of the circle is the, uh, the amount of population they have. So it's fun of data here, and it's got, I probably can't see this down at the bottom, but it's got a play button so that you can actually push play on this and see it over time. And we watch what happens as, you know, as humans, we're doing basically better. Everybody's kind of moving up and to the right. Uh, but there's some patterns in there. We can use filters to sort of find the stories that are interesting. So if I click on say Botswana, and I filter that out so that we can watch the pattern that happens there. You can see, like everybody else, Botswana is doing pretty well. Let me get to about 1990. 
and everybody starts dying from AIDS in Africa, right? And then you look at this chart and you see everything in the bottom left hand corner is blue, right? Because that's the color that Sub Saharan Africa is, which was just devastated by AIDS in the, in the 1990s and still continues to be. But look at the story, right? By, by, by providing filters, we can find stories and data that the providers of that data never even would have imagined existed in there. And I see this all the time. This is from the New York Times. I, I particularly like this visualization, which showed casualties of war in Iraq over the last, uh, well, since the war started. But I like this one because it was created by the designer, by the information design team in the New York Times in 2005, and then they let it keep running. So talk about not even knowing what stories are going to be in the data. We don't know how long the data is going to persist and, and how it's going to grow over time. We have no control over these data sets and need to provide tools like this one that provide that analysis for people, the tools, the filtering, the using the data as the, uh, as the interaction design, right? As the way of interacting with, with uh, uh, the thing that you're trying to understand. Uh, this is something that hit us really hard when we started to Google. This is uh, a small excerpt of a chart that we had designed uh, that showed all the relationships between the different reports and the data in those reports at Google Analytics. There were some, some like 96 different reports that we eventually got down to just about a dozen with many different facets uh, for exploring that data. But showing, and this was on our wall, it's about a 12 foot long diagram of, uh, in nine point types. You can, so it's a ton of data, right? And a ton of different types of data. Uh, which eventually we had to sort of acknowledge that we couldn't possibly design for every possible relationship. We had to provide the tools to allow people to find those relationships on their own and, and find different visualizations for the data that made sense to them. This is just an example uh, of different ways of doing different views of different kinds of data. So we spent a lot of time on that. So we, you know, think about it historically, right? And where that brings us today, really, really valid principles in the annals of information design, right? Where storytelling, right, like Menard's story and, and Dr. Snow's story, really very important. But to us, we need to think about that storytelling as a sense of discovery for our users. Rather than telling them a story, enabling discovery, right? Rather than providing visual clues for that story, we have to provide interactive tools that allow people to find the story themselves, to manipulate their own visual cues to, to interpret themselves. Right? And, and just like Snow edited down his chart, just like uh, 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 Mr. Beck in his uh, map of underground, edited down just the things that they wanted to show, very important. But now we need to think about that as filtering rather than just us doing the editing. So that's a big shift, right? That's a big shift from the data into the tools, from the, from the design into the interactivity. Um, uh, and, and it is kind of the fundamentals of a lot of things that people call Web 2.0, this sense of collaborative, uh, people working together of this collective intelligence and things like that. Because the only thing we could add to this and really make it go is a new branding. So we could have that. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're familiar with Flickr. Um, all of this is important as into the what we should do and the why we should do it, right? Or in the how we should do it. But the why is also, is also very, very important to me. And that's one of the things that I spent a lot of time on when I was at Google was helping all of uh, us and the product teams there understand why we were doing this and to whom we were communicating with these interfaces. Um, Google is a very, very user-centered place. I was very happy to be there because of that. Um, this is a visualization that came from the lobby uh, that I walked past every single day uh, when I arrived at Google. And it shows in nearly real time the, uh, the queries that are happening at all the data centers around the world at Google. So, uh, so we can get a sense of uh, just how many different people are using our products every single day. The, um, each bar or each shaft of lights coming out from a, a, a place where there is a, a data center located. Each, uh, the height of the bar is how much, uh, how many queries rather, and the color uh, are the languages that, are, that the query was in. So a really a global audience, right, which I think makes design really hard. In fact, that is a t-shirt that somebody gave me uh, that I would wear at Google occasionally. It's a map is easy, design is hard. You know what's not funny at Google? This t-shirt, <laughs> at all. <laughs> but when we would talk to you know, the engineers and the product people at Google, we talk about like, what is a Google user like? You know, we kind of, everybody would sort of talk about something like this, like pretty connected, uses technology every day, desperately needs a monitor upgrade. Right? <laughs> but, but you know, pretty, pretty comfortable with technology. And that's kind of a mind strategy 
to get started with, right? To kind of go after early adopters, see the things that they are interested, see how that trickles down to the rest of the, the world. But Google was well past that trickle down period, right? They had the rest of the world now. And I would say, yes, this is probably very true. People like this use Google every day in their connected offices with their, with their technologi technologically savvy brands. Um, but we get even more queries from uh, people like this, right? In fact, 70% of the traffic that came to Google uh, came from outside the United States. And the United States is fast becoming a, a more and more minority in the amount of traffic consumed uh, and requested and the search queries. So that meant that we had to understand how to design products that would be adaptable and understandable uh, and fit into context for people who have a very different notion of how technology fits into their lives and how they use technology to connect with their uh, with their social network and, uh, and to meet the information needs of people like this. And likewise, you know, this is a very big part of our audience. There's a, there's a particular audience that would really kind of scare the hell out of me, to be perfectly honest. Uh, perfectly honest. We talked to lots of teenagers. They told us lots of very interesting things. Like, for example, um, they use email to talk to old people. And that's about it. And that's, that's pretty significant for you know, a company that has a very big email application. That would mean that over time, we're going to have to shift a lot of our understanding and assumptions about what it means to provide communication tools, right? Because most uh, kids have very flexible and context-aware methods of communicating with one another, right? Depending on what they're doing in a given situation. Um, um, and very rarely are they sitting in front of a computer for long periods of time sharing documents back and forth and communicating and setting up meetings. Uh, they, do, they, they do those things in very, very different contexts. The other thing that we learned from talking to the teenagers was that they have such a different notion of private versus public that it is uh, a generational gap as divisive as music was in the 50s and 60s. They, uh, most of the people who didn't grow up with interconnected computers and, and took technology into their lives later uh, believe that everything they do on the computer is private until it's shared. Whereas these kids believe everything that they, that they do is public unless kept private. So that's a pretty big shift in how we understand how technology is going to be used. Um, and likewise, you know, we also have users like this uh, who would make two or three gigabytes a day of data and needed help indexing and sorting and searching and archiving and keeping all that data safe. Uh, and all of these users have multiple contacts throughout the day, and, and that's another thing we had to sort of understand. So you start to take all of these different vectors and areas and put that together into some cohesive understanding of who an audience is, and it's virtually impossible, right? Or at least very, very difficult for global sort of communication that we're doing on the web every day. Um, I'm going to show you a website that I think absolutely understands their audience so clearly that it's, I think, one of my favorite examples. Uh, I show, I've shown this site um, in presentations that I've given for years because I think they've done it absolutely perfectly. And it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture's hay net, which understands that their audience either needs hay or has hay. <laughs> One variable, that's it, that's all they need, right? And, and it makes you think, like, it could be awesome if we could design all of our websites that way. So that we have product and marketing and engineering and design and everybody at the table 
analyzing and synthesizing everything we've observed in the world as a good way, as a good foundation for building the products that we needed. And, you know, we would end up with walls and walls and documents full of this kind of stuff. And, and then quickly prototype that stuff and bring it into the lab. And again, I feel so fortunate to be able to have this kind of infrastructure at, a, at an organization like Google, where we had literally dozens of labs like this. Uh, this one in particular is really cool. I mean, we've got that one-way class, right? So the team can sit and watch a user struggle with the application, curse at the application, stuff like that. It's phenomenal to do that. Um, and these monitors are fancy laser monitors that shoot beams into your eyes and track your eyeballs where they go. I don't know how it works, but it's really cool. So we get, you know, these videotapes of people using the products and, you know, where their eyeballs were going. You can see that over time, right? Aggregate that into visualizations like this and show kind of how, uh, you know, how people were using search results and what they were looking at. You can do this kind of very fine grained optimization. All of it incredibly powerful. But all of it sort of, again, anesthetized, right? After a while, like this, uh, so we're always doing research. What are we really learning? What are we really trying to do? And, and that's where it sort of got me to today, where I have to try to find a balance between these things. I did, I, and I had a really great conversation with Jeffrey Zeldman, who I believe was keynoting here a few years ago, right? Jeffrey Zeldman is a standards guy from way back. Uh, this is a picture of him at a conference recently. Um, and I think, honestly, if you've been doing as much as he has for the last 15 years, or what, you can wear whatever you want to a conference. Um, but Jeffrey was, gave a, a presentation at this com conference saying that it's important that we start with the user and that we know ourselves, right? And you need to know yourself as well as the users. And I agree with that with a tiny tweak, which is, I think it's incredibly important to know yourself, right? And then understand the users. Because if we're just doing the research, right? If we're just constantly looking at data and analyzing it and synthesizing and trying to derive you know, what we should be doing on our websites just from the user research, I think it only takes us so far. And we get mediocre products that don't have any life to them, that lack the passion. Now, I did a conference earlier this summer uh, with a bunch of entrepreneurs talking about like what motivated them, uh, what you know uh, inspired them to make their products that were eventually successful. I talked to Matt Mullenweg, who is creator of WordPress. He's also 24 years old and has been working on WordPress for six years now. Um, and what he said was that everything I built has come from the frustration that it didn't yet exist. And this is a theme that I heard over and over again from entrepreneurs who had sort of left comfortable jobs or uh, you know, found themselves sort of trying to figure out what to do and found something that, that bothered them enough that they had to fix it. And that sort of started to inspire me as well, right? What is bothering me so much that I have to go fix it? And it's pretty rare to me that, you know, that would come across my desk at, at the variety of jobs that I've had in the past. Occasionally it would, but, but whatever it did, it's always the thing that I was the most proud of. Uh, we talked to Old Malik, who's a, a, a journalist who writes Data Old and is uh, quite you know, popular Web 2.0 pundit. And he said, even him, total jaded journalist guy, new ideas come from your heart, not your wallet. Which is hard for the sort of venture capital community to swallow. But it's true, from your heart, from the passion that we have. And to me, it started making me reflect on all this user research I've done in the past. And made me realize that it's a lot like travel. That it's a lot like going places that I've never been before and experiencing new cultures, right? And seeing the world through other people's eyes. And it didn't make me able to make things for them, but it decreased the distance between me and them, right? As we as we go around and see the way different people live and the way that they experience the world, it decreased the distance between who I was and who the rest of the world was. And from that, that's where we can draw a lot of the empathy. So inspiration. Right, can really come from there. And that's what we really need to make our product so good because it's really, really hard work. I have this quote that uh, is long, but I want to read it to you. It's really good. It's from uh, this guy, Steve Jobs. And he said, when you start to look, uh, when you start looking at a problem and it seems really simple with all these simple solutions, you don't really understand the complexity of the problem and the solutions are way too oversimplified that they don't work. Then you get into the problem and you see it's really complicated. And you come up with all these convoluted solutions and it's sort of the middle and that's where most people stop and the solutions tend to work for a while. And he's right, that's where most products really end up being, right? Convoluted solutions to really difficult problems. But the really great person will keep on going, find a key underlying principle of the problem, come up with a beautiful and elegant solution that works. And I find that incredibly inspiring. Especially considering it wasn't Steve, this Steve Jobs that said it, it was this Steve Jobs that said it at the launch of the Macintosh in 1984. 
when he was 20-something years old. So that's where we need to sort of find the energy to keep making our products better, right? To, to find that passion that we can put in there. We can find inspiration from, you know, stuff like that, and from the past, right? Looking back at what people have done before us and the things that they've created and achieved and discovered uh, and passed down to us. And we can look, you know, at all the stuff that's happening around us today in the contemporary world and the, the amazing future that we're glimpsing into the web, social networking, data visualization, and stuff like that. We can look to our users for inspiration as well, right? To shorten that gap between us and them, so that we can understand what to make, so that the stuff that we feel passionate about can come out and be understandable and actionable for them, and usable for them. And it's remarkable, right, where we, uh, where we find inspiration all around us. It can come from almost anywhere. All right, so uh, this is educational conference. I give you some homework. Here's your homework. I'm going to, uh, if you like, if you find this stuff interesting, these are some of the things that brought me on this journey. Uh, Stephen Johnson is a pretty popular author these days. He wrote the book The Ghost Map. I've got a URL at the end so you don't have to scribble everything down. You can download this presentation. He wrote this book The Ghost Map about Jon Snow's journey through that data visualization. And it reads like a detective novel. It's really, really interesting. Um, the godfather of information design is Edward Tufte. Uh, he uh, has written a bunch of books, Envisioning Information. Uh, I, I read this about 12 years ago, and it fundamentally changed the way I saw the world. So start with that one if you're interested in really getting into data visualization stuff. And then, uh, if, you're, if you're very technical, uh, or even if you're not, this book by Ben Fry, uh, he's the guy who that created the Java processing libraries that do amazing data visualization stuff. Ben Fry wrote this book for a writer called Visualizing Data. Uh, it is 90% lines of Java code and explanations for how the library works in 10%. Absolutely fascinating stuff about bringing interactivity into data uh, and maps and charts and, and stuff like that. Great stuff. So check that one out. And uh, that's what I have. So thank you very much. Driven by speculation in our industry, the dot com industry, 
industry, which was uh, completely unrealistic um, expectations for what would happen to the, the IPOs that were going on and things like that. So we took a lot of the capital that was in the markets and moved it into something insanely risky uh, that wasn't proved out. Uh, when that fell apart, everybody moved into the real estate, and then that didn't work either. So, uh, but that's essentially what happened. So I always, I, you know, I think collectively, or at least uh, Sandhill Road and Silicon Valley, we can take a little responsibility for 2000, 2001, uh, less so now. So that's, that's what gives me the optimism that we're doing all right this time. Uh, we're out of time, so I'll be around for a little while. But again, thank you very much.